Welcome to Trial Site News Podcast Series. We're excited to have Dr. Greg Fay here with us today. We will be discussing his fascinating work on anti-aging. Dr. Fay is the Chief Scientific Officer of Intervene Immune. We cover their notable story about the FDA-approved study that exhibited evidence of age reversal on average of, of about 2.5 years. So, Dr. Fay, welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. We're, we're excited to have you here. Now, Dr. Fay, you founded Intervene Immune in 2011 based on your LinkedIn profile. Could you share more about the context of why you launched that firm? We launched Intervene Immune because we really had to. And, and what I mean by that is that there has been this huge need out there for decades that no one has been interested in addressing, and we just had to do something about it. So I've been on the trail of this idea since about 1986, when a very significant paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. That paper showed that immune system aging, at least in rats, could be entirely reversed uh, over a fairly short period of time using growth hormone. In the study, they implanted growth hormone secreting cells into the rats, which we wouldn't do in humans, of course, but the point was that the growth hormone was able to regrow the thymus, which is the master gland of the immune system, and thereby restore youthful immune function in these old rats. So we wanted to see if we could do something like that in people. Hmm. Now, uh, for those that don't know, what is the thymus and why is it so important for aging? The thymus is the master gland of the immune system. It's located in your chest cavity between your best bone and your lungs and heart. And its job is to educate cells that are made in the bone marrow and turn them into immune system cells that fight off things that want to kill you, like bacteria, viruses, and even cancer cells. So we need the thymus to make these these sort of foot soldiers of your immune system called the T cells. They're called T cells because they're actually made in the thymus. And eventually, unfortunately, we start to run out of T cell function. And I believe the reason for that is that the thymus begins to peter out around the age of puberty. So if you actually look at your thymus when you're a teenager, it's much more infiltrated with fat and is much less rich in functional thymic tissue than it was when you were first born. And by the time you get to 40 or 50, the thymus is largely shot. It's mostly replaced with fat. That makes means it cannot do its job anymore. It cannot make new T cells, cannot defend you against things that want to kill you. And then basically, that when, when all of that falls apart between the ages of 60 and 80, that's about the time that everybody begins to die. And so that may not be a complete coincidence. Uh, so we wanted to do something about that and restore the thymus to its youthful ability to make new T cells, restore new T cells to the circulation so that if you encounter a new kind of disease organism, your body can defend you against it. And this is important because, for example, 90% of all people who die of the flu and pneumonia are over the age of 65. And that's because they don't have good immune systems anymore. So this is a really important health issue and a limiting factor for longevity. Uh, And so we felt we could do something about that. So that's the reason that we felt we had to launch the company and, and get started. No, that makes perfect sense, specifically for what you were just saying about you know, uh, older folks that, that get hit with the flu and, and die. That's, that's very true. Now, your recent research with Steve Horvath of UCLA included a small study that effectively reversed all nine participants' epigenetic cloud. Could you break this down for Trial Site News audience? And what does this mean? Exactly. So what we did is we applied our thymus regeneration treatment to nine men. They were between the ages of 51 and 65 inclusive. And we applied it for one year. And then in some of the guys, about uh, six of them, we were able to do a follow-up on them uh, six months later. So at 18 months after the beginning of the trial. We did the trial based at Stanford University. We had IRB approval. We had an IND from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And what we found at the end of the trial was that not only were we able to regrow the thymus, and not only were we able to reverse the trend toward declining new T cells in your circulation, but we also found 
that along with that came what looked like a more global reversal of the aging process. So we noticed things like kidney function getting better instead of getting worse over time. We noticed things like hair coming in darker than it used to be in a couple of our guys. Uh, and so we began to wonder if there might be a more general effect on aging itself. And fortunately, Dr. Horvath at UCLA has developed a way of measuring aging. It's called the epigenetic clock, and it looks at your DNA. And your DNA is more or less active in certain respects as you go from being one age to another age. So Dr. Horvath is able to tell you to within about two or three years how old you are just by taking a blood sample. Uh -huh. and, and in fact, if his test of aging says you're actually older than you should be for your, bio, your chronological age, you probably are. But if you're younger than you should be for your chronological age, you're probably younger you know, biologically uh, based on uh, follow-up studies that he has done. So we were able to use this magical tool, this epigenetic clock of aging, uh, to study the age of our guys before and after one year of treatment. And what we found is that on average, based on actually not just one clock, but four different clocks, all of which agreed with each other, that our guys at the end of the trial were about one and a half years younger than they were before they started the trial. But of course, they were also a year older chronologically than they were before they started the trial. So if you, you know, look at it as a reversal from the, the age that they ended up at, then that was a two and a half year uh, aging reversal compared to doing nothing, compared to sitting on the sofa and just carrying out their normal life uh, style. So this is the first time that aging reversal has been documented in humans. Actually, it's the first time that epigenetic aging reversal has been documented in any organism, including rats, mice, or anything else. So it's very interesting. In this case, humans led the way. We're ahead of the rats and mice for a change. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and that's amazing on, on two points. The rats didn't have to get it done first and that you pulled this off. Now, you alluded to it a little bit, but is epigenetic aging the same as aging itself? That is an important point. So epigenetic aging can only measure gene activity. We believe gene activity is the main driver of aging. But there are other things that do go on that are not picked up by the epigenetic clock. And probably the most obvious one is telomere shortening. So in a way, telomeres, which are like uh, caps on the end of each chromosome, and they get shorter as the cells divide. As we get older, uh, each time the cell divides, it has a little bit less telomeric DNA left. And eventually, the telomeres get short enough to the point where they start causing all kinds of problems, including potentially an increase in cancer risk. And we measured telomeres in our trial. We didn't really see a difference, at least nothing that I would be impressed enough to describe to you. <laughs> so um, I, I think that there may be other things that still need to be looked at in aging, but the fundamental driver of aging, the, the driver of most aging and most disability with age uh, is what we were able to measure, and that did show a reversal. So we're very happy with that. Oh, as you should. Now, I've got to ask, and I'm sure our audience wants to know, is how did you discover a way to reverse epigenetic aging in people? Right. So we really discovered a way of reversing epigenetic aging in people by accident. We had hoped that we might see an effect, but we really had no strong pre-existing data that would really strongly indicate that this is going to happen. Uh, but what we were really trying to do was to restore immune system function by regrowing the thymus. And there had been some studies in the past indicating that if you take an old uh, mouse with poor immune function and you transplant into that old mouse a young thymus, that will temporarily, uh, excuse me, that will temporarily restore immune function in the old animal. But what they discovered along the way is it also does some amazing things elsewhere in the body. For example, it seems to have rejuvenation effects on the liver. It seems to have rejuvenating effects on the brain. It seemed to help hypothyroidism. It seemed to help insulin sensitivity problems, which are what underlie diabetes, which we all tend to get as we get older. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are rather profound anti-aging effects 
that at first glance have nothing to do with the immune system, but, but seem to be there based on these scattered studies from a, a bunch of Italian uh, immunologists many years ago that received very little attention. But of course, there was no similar evidence in humans, so we had no idea if this would actually apply to people or not. It was very speculative, but that may be one way that allowed us to get to where we got to. So maybe the influence of the thymus on aging in general is what we've actually been able to stumble upon and basically sh uh, provide evidence for for the first time in, in humans. I think the other way that we did it is by the choice of methodologies that we use to regrow the thymus. So the thymus normally undergoes this process of involution or deterioration that really kicks in about the time of puberty. Uh, and uh, that is a biologically controlled process. But the thymus retains the ability to respond to signals even as it gets older and older. And it was shown in 1986 that one of the signals that the thymus can respond to is growth hormone. So the fundamental thing that we did was to use growth hormone to regrow the thymus. And maybe then that, that regrowth of the thymus led to the other positive effects. But uh, we didn't use just growth hormone because growth hormone by itself also does bad things. There okay. are things about growth hormone that's good, like restoring maybe the uh, function of the immune system perhaps, but it also does bad things like reduce insulin sensitivity, which what that means is it's a pre-diabetic effect or even an outright effect. Sometimes people call, call it a diabetogenic effect. Uh, and we didn't like that because we know that that effect causes insulin levels to go up. Insulin is bad for you. Insulin is a pro-aging molecule. Insulin may be one of the universal drivers of aging throughout different phyla. <clears throat> and so we wanted to change that by using insulin sensitizers that would counteract this bad effect of growth hormone. So we used two insulin sensitizers, one of which I developed actually, uh, in a sense, uh, and that's DHEA. DHEA has been around for a long time. People have known about it for a long time, but, they, but there has not been uh, this insight that maybe DHEA could control the diabetogenic effect of growth hormone. I tried it myself several times. It always seemed to work in myself. We tried it in the trial that we did at Stanford and it seemed to work in others as well. But we then also added in metformin because we needed extra power. And metformin has been looked at as a possible aging slow, uh, it's been looked at as a, as a drug for possibly slowing the aging process by other people. Hmm. Uh, and we found uh, in different studies that it's a great um, mimic of calorie restriction, which is one of the most powerful aging interventions there is. So I think that this magic combination of growth hormone, DHEA, and metformin is a, another major factor that explains why we were able to reverse epigenetic aging in, in humans. Which is really amazing. And also, I just wanted to add, too, with uh, the sensitivity there with your, with your insulin, the other positive side is you know, insulin is bad for you not just with aging but with weight gain. I mean, that's one of the, the big uh, factors for folks that gain weight is you eat a lot of sugar, which triggers more insulin in the body, which then causes you to gain weight. And uh, so That's, that's right. And, and we, all, we all tend to replace muscle with fat as we get older. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it's kind of built in. But interestingly enough, growth hormone does the opposite. Growth hormone burns fat, but ironically and unfortunately, it also raises insulin. So it, it, it has a good effect that it contradicts with this bad effect. So what we were trying, what we were trying to do is get the good effect and get rid of the bad effect. Yep, instead of confusing the body. <laughs> yes, exactly. I there you more go. Consistently anti-aging. Yes, which is amazing, and we love the we love the work that you're doing here. Now I have to ask, how did you first get really intensely interested in aging? I've been interested in aging since I was in the third grade. I started reading papers on molecular biology when I was in junior high school. Uh, as I started reading my first book on aging when I was a senior in high school. When I was a student at the University of California at Irvine, I team taught a course on aging. Uh, so I've been interested in aging for a long time, but I wasn't really able to do much about it other than stay up with the field, see what was going on, and learn about all the amazing work that people were doing. 
uh, until fairly recently. So I, I, I actually did my first aging experiment in 1996, and the subject of that experiment was myself. I tried to regenerate my own thymus using growth hormone, and I actually had some partial success with that. Oh, wow. And I published that in the Journal of Anti-Aging Medicine, which is now called Rejuvenation Research. And that attracted some attention and got some conversations going. And eventually, I was able to found this company, uh, Intervene Immune, so that we could actually try this on a significant number of people. Hmm. So my, my interest in aging goes way back. Well, we're, we're happy that it did, because here we are today. Now... Out of curiosity, do you see other competition from biotech ventures now that you've been making waves with what you've done? Well, I'm sure there will be. There's a, an amazing amount of interest associated with our results out there in the scientific literature already. We only published our paper in September, but there's already been another paper that's been published in Rejuvenation Research that reviews our results and puts them in context in great detail. We have heard physicians saying you know, to us that they want to try it. Um, so in fact, there's a person uh, in the UK who is using an in vitro model. That's a sort of a test tube model to check the components of our approach to see if they can s decipher which might have the strongest effect on aging reversal. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on. We actually have very important scientists writing to us and offering to analyze some of our samples using their techniques which we don't have available to us so mm. that we can learn much more about not only what happened to the immune system but what happened to things that may relate to the possibility of avoiding leukemia in the future all oh, kinds wow. of things like that so we're very excited about the scientific uh, attention that we've received and of course that will result in heightened interest uh, on the part of people and perhaps coming up with competing technologies However, we do think that we understand this field pretty well and that we have chosen the approach that is most likely to be the best approach. But we will, of course, be looking at all alternative approaches as we go forward, to make sure we can offer the best possible service to our trial volunteers and eventually to our clinical clients. And uh, if other people can come along and come up with even better approaches, good for them because we all want to do something about aging uh, and immune system decline. These are huge problems and we need solutions for them. And so it's a huge field. It's There's plenty of room for everybody, but of course uh, we hope to remain the leaders. <laughs> as, as it should be. Well, and that really is the bottom line and uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, and you kind of alluded to it when we were talking about biotech ventures, but um, research centers that are specializing in aging, are there any others that are doing anything like what you're doing? There's really nothing in the United States to speak of. Uh, there have been uh, things done that are kind of related, but, but nothing exactly like this. There has been an effort to essentially build thymuses in, in the laboratory so they can be transplanted later. I think those studies are problematic for certain technical reasons. So I don't think that that's really going to be as good as what we're trying to do. Although, of course, uh, everybody is free to try their own angle. Uh, I understand that there's research going on in Europe that is aimed at regrowing the thymus. However, the approaches they're taking do not seem to me at least to be as robust as the method that we've used. It's possible that they will start investigating our method too, at least to compare to theirs. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, so there are major aging centers that exist. Uh, there's wonderful work going on. There are approaches to dealing with aging that are quite different than our own. Uh, some of the major centers are in San Diego at the uh, Scripps Institute. Uh, there's a fantastic laboratory in uh, Harvard in which wonderful people are doing wonderful things. There's great work going on at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, but there's nothing quite like what we're doing anywhere, as far as I know. Not as far as I've heard or what we've seen either. Uh, so, Dr. Fay, uh, before we let you go today, I know you're a busy man, but if you could tell us, what are your plans here for the near future? Well, in the near future, what we would like to do is sort of pick up where we left off. So, we completed this trial and we got great results, but there were some questions that were left unanswered. 
For example, the trial was based on men only, so we need to understand how this works in women. It was only uh, Caucasian men by chance, and so we need to see what happens in different ethnic and minority groups. It did not have a control group. We did not compare our people to anyone else. We just compared each man to himself at baseline, and that's a valid technique, but it would also be comfortable for many people to have a, an untreated group to compare the treated group to. Uh, and so for things, uh, for reasons like that, we'd like to do more extensive trials. So we were hoping to actually start a new trial as early as this coming January, January of 2020. And it will have several subgroups to include women and people of different ages, people with imperfect health, et cetera. So we're planning to learn a great, great deal in the next couple of years and hopefully get our treatment in shape for clinical deployment before most anti-aging companies could even think about doing so because what we do is that we use uh, drugs that uh, the FDA likes and is not afraid of. And we hope that that will lead to rapid approval by the FDA and rapid uh, remedies for people who actually need them. Well, that sounds amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, I can guarantee you that we here at Trial Site News will be continuing to follow your progress as it moves forward. And we know you're a busy man, so thank you so much for spending time with us today. Well, I'm so glad uh, glad that you're interested. Thank you very much for, for inviting me, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have more interesting news to report to you later. Well, thank you. And now for those of you in the audience interested in learning more, you can visit uh, his website at interveneimmune.com, which will be provided in the description below as well. You can also find Trial Site News on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and the links will also be provided in the description below. So thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.